I am the uh, director of planning for the Sacramento area flood control agency. I, I was the agency council for many years and I actually attended UC Davis in 1983 to 86. So uh, raised a family here. Always a pleasure to be back uh, on this side of the river. So I've handed out to everyone, and you may keep it, a map of the state federal levy project in the Sacramento Valley. Um, and I want to talk a, a little bit about the evolution of this flood control system um, and kind of where we are today and where we may be going, um, particularly uh, in the aftermath of the first major update of the plan for, for flood control in the valley, which occurred uh, uh, in June of 2012 with the Central Valley Flood Protection Board's adoption of the new Central Valley Flood Protection Plan that was developed by the Department of Water Resources. But I think it's important to have a little background to try to understand uh, the problems we're facing and some of the ideas that we have about um, how we might address those problems. So the first thing to notice obviously is this is a incredibly vast complex system. All those red lines on the map are levees and they're all part of a commonly administered system um, administered by the state of California through the Central Valley now called the Central Valley Flood Protection Board um, with sort of joint jurisdiction with the Army Corps of Engineers. So the system was uh, built up by local interests, by the state, and then finally uh, by the Army Corps of Engineers. And it was not anything self-evident, let's say, to people who came to this valley in the 19th century that you could have a system on this scale because in that day and age nobody really looked to the state government, much less the federal government, for this kind of a governmental service, i.e. the financing and providing of flood protection to the folks who came into the valley initially to mine for gold and then of course to uh, develop agriculture um, and so for the early days of the system, I'm talking primarily in the last half of the 19th century, this was all done by locals and their counties forming drainage and reclamation districts and it was kind of the era well characterized in that book, Battling the Inland Sea, where, you know, water, and particularly flood water, was regarded as a common enemy and therefore everybody had a right to keep the water away from them and push it anywhere else they wanted to go. And so we had a very long, protracted period lasting really uh, from the time people came in the 1850s and 60s on into the first part of the 20th century where um, there really was no overall coordination of flood control planning and it was really every community for themselves. Um, but people did recognize that that wasn't a particularly efficient way or even you know in their own interest at some point uh, way to to manage this problem which would you know periodically visit the valley these intense rainstorms delivering water out of the Sierra coming relatively quickly down onto the floodplain where people were trying to either live in the cities that had grown up around the gold rush and you can see on the map and the map has kind of the shaded areas are where urban development exists today, but you know, the four historic settlements that came during the Gold Rush period were Yuba City on the west side of the Feather River, Marysville at the confluence of the Feather and the Yuba, those were the two kind of northernmost settlements built up, you know, to service gold mining and eventually agriculture in Sutter and Yuba County, and then down in our area, Sacramento, on the east side of the river, and West Sacramento, or it started out as the town of Washington, but West Sacramento on the west side of the river. And those were the four kind of historic settlements. Um, and they remain today the principal concentrations of urban development in the valley that are at relatively low elevation and rely on levees for their protection. Otherwise, it's mostly very large agricultural districts 
um, some of which, like Natomas, north of Sacramento, and Reclamation District 784 or Plumas Lakes, south of uh, Marysville, have now themselves become a focus of subdivision and development in the, in the modern day. But, but mostly, the urban settlements are kind of where they started. They've just gotten bigger and have become uh, ever more reliant on this flood control system for protection. In any case, the notion that the state and possibly even the federal government could play a role in building up the system was, was novel and revolutionary in 20th century California. And it really took the progressive era of the early uh, 20th century in the 1900s and under the governorship of Hiram Johnson for the progressives in California to say, you know, this is something that needs to be done. We need to foster the economic development of the Sacramento Valley, the agriculture therein, and the cities that live there. And that takes a coherent, uh, systematic approach to managing floodwaters in the Sacramento Valley. And that's not anything that can well be done by these competing localities. And therefore, it makes sense for the state to step up and begin to take responsibility for organizing, planning, and maintaining the system on a large scale. And for no other reason that one of the insights, and locals had this insight in some cases more than flood planners, was when these big floods hit the valley, in the upper part of the valley, the Feather and the Sacramento River, very hard to keep those flood flows confined to a levied channel because the amount of the runoff, and we're really think about it as, you know, your commute time, you know, between 7 and 9 a.m. and 4 to 6 p.m., everybody's on the freeway and there just don't seem to be enough lanes. Now, if you just would come throughout the day, everybody would go, well, there's no problem. But it's not the way we live and that's not the way floods happen. So floods happen in our valley as peak discharges and the measuring stick for those peak peak discharges is typically the volume over 72 hours and the volume over 72 hours can be very large. Large enough that it was very difficult to keep flood flows confined to levied channels and so the idea of allowing these floods to kind of seek their historic floodplains was a key insight for building up the notion of this more systematically organized and maintained system and that's what gave rise to those big blue areas there which are the bypass systems not not so much the one on the bottom that's the feather river and even in the feather river the levees were actually set back quite a bit but I'm talking about the Sutter bypass and then in particular the Yola bypass which can be thought of as sort of common areas for the system and so the question was, well, who would build and maintain these common areas and who would take responsibility? And that's really where the notion that the state, uh, you know, in the progressive era felt it appropriate to step up and do that. But it didn't happen quickly or easily. And in fact, it took two large floods in 1907 and 1909 to be the sort of final impetus for the state to say, all right, we need to get going. We need to kind of build the system that you're looking at up there eventually. Um, and that occurred uh, initially with the legislature adopting a plan for controlling floods in the Sacramento Valley in 1911. The core was not far behind. The core's hindrance was in federal jurisprudence and practice, the federal government really only had a mission of navigation. Okay, because in, in that day and age, we didn't allow the federal government, it sounds, seems like we may be returning to yesteryear, but you know, in, in yesteryear, we didn't allow the federal government to do a whole lot of things, but one of them was plan for and facilitate interstate commerce and navigation. So the Corps came to the Sacramento Valley to help with navigation, and the navigation problem was, as I said, you had these historic communities Sacramento, West Sacramento, Marysville, Yuba City, living on the river and dependent on the river for commerce because the roads through the valley in that day were very poor. 
But the navigation was troublesome too because when the miners finished picking up all the easy gold in the stream, they started blasting it up off the hillsides and so there was just this constant mass of sediment coming out of the mountains and into the system lasting all the way into the 1880s until finally the California Supreme Court said enough, it's a nuisance, you can't just discharge your mining debris into the system. But the Corps was here to kind of figure out how to make the rivers more navigable under their navigation authority and so they were big proponents of building high levees near the river channel so that in flood stage, the floodwaters, as they had learned in the Mississippi, could drive that sediment on down the river and make for better navigation. And they were resistant to the idea of these large bypasses. But with the floods of 1907 and 1909, basically everybody got on the, they were very large floods, the largest of their day. Everybody got on the same page and said, all right, we need to begin moving in this direction. And it literally took, you know, five decades to build up this system. Well, the system really wasn't fully complete until the state uh, you know, announced they were prepared to accept responsibility for the operation and maintenance of this completed system. And so there's a memorandum of 1957 where the Corps turns the system over to the state of California for operation and maintenance, essentially the system you're looking at there. So you know, we went from, and, and that's maybe I would say there are claims that people envisioned this as early as 1860. So it took a century to have an idea and to get to the first reality of its you know, creation. So all of us who are here today who are in the business of ideas have to be a little humble about how long it takes for our society to understand us and to implement our wisdom. But anyway, it took a, it took a long time. And then, you know, along came the New Deal and, you know, a greatly expanded sense of the federal role in society, a notion of the possibilities of engineering on a scale even greater than this that tended to focus on building dams for water conservation, hydropower, recreation, all the good things that the society of the starting really in the late 30s, 40s, and then 50s and 60s found desirable. This was integrated water management because you could build these facilities you know, in the right locations on these systems. They would not only then add a whole new layer of you know support to this flood control system because the dams could hold back those three-day peak volumes and virtually double or really increase the capacity of the system probably by a greater than twice what it was capable of holding and what it was designed for without the headwater dams and then provide you know the water plumbing system that I know you've been studying in your other speakers. So the construction of the dams came along in that period right after uh, basically the levee system had been completed. And it was envisioned to do something more. This, this one was really designed with the flood of record in mind. In other words, we had these big floods in 1907, 1909, so let's build a system that could contain those record floods. That's basically what the levee system was designed for. Then the designers of the dams, the promoters of the dams, and came along and said, you know, there's now a much greater concentration of people in those urban centers in Sacramento, in Yuba City, in Marysville, who require perhaps a more uh, protective standard than the flood of record. And so the theory of the 1950s and 60s, primarily developed by the Corps of Engineers, is that we need to pro provide these concentrated urban areas with protection against the largest flood, the most extreme flood that's reasonably foreseeable given the hydrologic characteristics of the basin. Not just the record flood, but the flood that we could possibly reasonably anticipate that could occur and they developed a methodology mostly by taking these historic floods and then working with them to expand and enlarge them into what they felt to be very extreme floods that could then be controlled by the headwater dams so that the water 
arriving with those big floods could be kept within the levee systems below the dams. And that was the design standard that drove Folsom Dam and then later Oroville, which was, is also worked in tandem with New Bullard's Bar Dam on the Yuba River. So we first had the flood of record, then we had the more exacting and demanding standard project flood, and that uh, phase of dam building basically got completed in the 1970s, although the Auburn Dam was always still trailing along behind, never quite made it, but you know, uh, this was a, a big augmentation to the capacity of the system. In the 1970s, the nation began to debate how do we address the damages due to flooding that are now tending to happen across the United States with a degree of frequency and a discussion about developing the National Flood Insurance Program. It happened in the United States and in the Congress during the 1970s. And you know, the result of that discussion was no private insurers were interested. Nobody wanted to come in and insure against flood damages because the pool was basically just a bunch of exposed people. There weren't enough, you know, non-at-risk people to make it a good bet for a private insurance. So the government basically said, all right, we're going to back the, you know, insurance of structures in the floodplain. They said, well, okay, we need a set of standards. And the Congress had a debate about what standard should apply for building homes in a floodplain that we're standing behind with our insurance. And we had proponents of the flood of record, and we had proponents of the standard project flood. And the flood of record was viewed to be, nah, that's, that's really, that you can't administer a national program based on a flood of record. The, the standard project flood had similar problems and it was seen as too exacting, it was too expensive. And so they settled on the statistical 1% annual risk of flooding. The 100 year flood would be the flood that we would administer the national flood insurance program on. And so the Corps of Engineers was given the responsibility to develop the statistical program for how we derive the one in 100 year flood for the communities across the country. And they did. And they developed a whole set of procedures for how you calculate these relatively extreme events and then regulate and manage the system around them. In 19, so the National Flood Insurance Program was basically set up in 1973 and 1978. Sacramento, West Sacramento, Sacramento County, the city, and others in the valley joined the National Flood Insurance Program. And we then confronted, well, do they meet that standard? And FEMA turned to the Corps of Engineers and said, do these communities meet our 100-year standard? And the Corps contemplating what we'd created with this system and the headwater dams and the rest of what had been done up to that point, said to FEMA, well, we don't know of any reason why they don't. <laughs> well, okay, that's good enough. So basically, all the communities in the valley came into the National Flood Insurance Program in the late 70s with zone designations of B, moderate risk of flooding, or in some cases C, minimum, minimal risk of flooding. And that really permitted the development of the 1970s and 80s to go forward without any National Flood Insurance Program constraints or complications. Then came the record flood of 1986. Okay, and the record flood of 1986 was like one of those stress tests that we supposedly subject our banks to to see how they're doing. But this was actually a physical stress test because it was the first one that we'd had since the whole system had been put together, including the headwater dams, to see how would this system respond. And while we didn't have huge catastrophic flooding, we had some flooding, and we had some very distressed levees, and we did have flooding along the, the, the south levee of the Yuba River failed into the towns of uh, Olivehurst and, and Linda uh, up in Yuba County, and that became the Paterno case that I'll talk about a little later. But Sacramento, we kind of skimmed by, okay? And to give you a sense of what was happening in the city of Sacramento in 1986, this whole system was really developed by the state and the federal government and local government really in the modern day had very little to do with this flood control system. 
and very little connection to it. And so even though we built a city in a levee protected floodplain, you cannot find any discussion of the challenges, complications, or anything else related to developing an urban city in the levee protected floodplain. If you look at any of the documents from the city in say the 1970s or 80s or even after we had CEQA in place and you know no analysis of flood risk because it was I think we're okay aren't we okay yeah we're okay they said we're okay the state and the federal government are in charge what do we got to do with that okay and so when the 1986 flood came here's the city going wow how's the look out there you know and I, I was in this I didn't not that I came to the city two years later but you know the public works director Mel Johnson is calling back to the city manager Mel Slipe and he's walking the levee on the Natomas East Main Drain on the east side of Natomas. And, you know, Walt, the, the, the water's right up at the top. You know, what do you want to do? Well, I'm not sure. You know, keep me posted. You know, there was nothing. Okay? No plan, nothing. It was as though, you, you know, people would have come from another planet and say, let me get this straight. You built the city in a deep flood plain protected by levees, and you got no idea what to do when a flood comes along? I mean, that was literally the local awareness because you know we're taken care of right yeah as far as I know we're taken care of but since 1986 now what did actually happen is that we found the levees on the in the Natomas area in particular and down along the Sacramento River which had been made from the sediment that had been washed and continues to wash through the system they're, they're pretty sandy those levees and when the water was up against them for a long period of time as it was in 1986 they began to you know seep water through the levees and in Natomas where where the levees had basically been built with these fantastic story but I mean these big suction dredge machines that just sucked the sand up off the bottom of the river into a trench that they had cut along the Sacramento River and then they take the dirt when they're finished and you know kind of make a burrito okay and so the the water got so super saturated in the levee that the land side part of the burrito started failing and the water going through and the levee was about to fail and we came very close in the Thomas to losing the levee on the Sacramento River. Uh, the pocket levee was under a fair amount of duress, and we had to make releases from Folsom Dam that were, you know, higher than was considered the safe level of release. The system was set up to release 115,000 cubic feet per second. We had to release 134, and that's why Mel Johnson was going, geez. You know, the water six inches from the top. We, we nearly had levy overtopping and failure. So after 1986, my agency was created, as were other local agencies around the valley, and we commenced to work with the state of California and the Corps of Engineers to evaluate what had just happened here and to formulate, you know, plans of improvement. And the main conclusion that was drawn is that you need to stabilize these embankments, the sandy embankments uh, in the Tomas and in the pocket area and some other places around the, the valley and that was basically done by putting these cutoff walls not down through the foundation of the levee but at least through the levee itself to kind of stabilize it so the water couldn't go through and pull the material out on the other end or in some cases building uh, seepage berms on the land side to stabilize them and raise levees and in our case over in Sacramento build another dam upstream of Folsom at the old Auburn Dam site but due to the controversy around the multi-purpose Auburn just make it a flood control dam and we'll decide later whether it will ever hold water permanently but the point I want to make about that is we had to debate standards okay and there was general agreement that the hundred year standard which we had kind of organized our life around was really not an adequate standard. You know, thinking back to the old standard project flood notion that, you know, concentrations of people with a high potential for loss of life and extensive property damage, you need something more than the minimum 100 year standard. But the core had become deeply embedded in statistics and had abandoned the old you know provide protection against the most extreme flood that we might reasonably you know expect to occur and they had gone to a more statistical program that said in effect provide the level of flood protection that provides the optimum 
economic benefit. So it was kind of an economic benefit analysis. And in Sacramento, you could generate a fairly high you know, level of benefit because we had a lot of people here. Okay, and so the National Economic Development Plan was sort of the federal approach to setting standards for federal investment and that well justified building an Auburn Dam. We in SAFCA, working with the state of California, kind of, you know, we didn't agree that national economic development was the way to look at flood control because we were still more public safety based. And so we sort of developed this notion of provide a high level of flood protection for urban areas like Sacramento, at least one in 200 year flood protection. That is where this one in 200 thing came from. It you know, was a pragmatic response by us in the state to try to reach back to that old public safety standard. And the standard project flood was typically said to be one in 200 to one in 500. That's the kind of flood protection that urban areas ought to have. So we evolved in 1990 this notion of provide urban areas with one in 200 year flood protection. And that has now become deeply embedded in the planning of, of the system as we're going forward. And we accomplished a great deal between 1986 and when we had another large flood in 1997. But, you know, as a general rule, I mean, it was relatively modest in term, in, in, especially in comparison to what had gone before and in comparison to what we really needed. So 1997, a flood on the scale of the 1986 flood came along and another response came to, you know, what do we need to do here? The Corps of Engineers worked with the state of California. They developed a comprehensive plan for this program, but it, it really didn't go anywhere because the federal government didn't have truly the initiative, the money, state government didn't either and so we had kind of a period where although everybody was recognizing the need there was not really a kind of a galvanized response after 1997. One thing we did however do which now has huge implications for the administration of the system going forward is there was in 1997 a levee failure along the east side of the Feather River into Plumas Lakes in the near the town of Arboga and that levee failure was thought to have resulted from water going beneath the levee and pushing material beneath the foundation of the levee, bringing the material to the surface on the land side of the levee and pushing that material up and out of the foundation, creating voids beneath the levee and causing the levee to fail due to under seepage. So by 2003, the state and the Army Corps of Engineers became committed to the notion that under seepage is a significant risk factor in the Sacramento Valley. It hadn't been thought to be that in the past. In the past, under seepage was a flood fighting issue. If the boil came up on the land side of the levee, you came out and you formed your sandbags around it and you controlled the boil, but it would be hideously expensive to go and do all the exploration and all the work that you would need to preempt under seepage. But after the 97 flood, that became the rule of the road for everybody, basically. And it became a risk factor to be evaluated in whether your levees met even the federal 100-year test. Now, the reason that's significant is you look at all these levees here. There is no way in the world that all those agricultural districts are going to be able to address this risk factor, even analyze it. You know, all the money that it would take to go and evaluate foundation conditions and then all the money it would take to go address that. So from 2003 onward, we have been sort of evolving to what is really a two-tier system. Urban areas that can afford to address under seepage are going to have to do so on pain of falling into the 100-year floodplain and paying very high insurance rates. Agricultural areas, they're not going to be able to do this and they are not going to be able to achieve that higher standard of flood protection and they are now going to have to deal with the fate of how are they going to be regulated within the National Flood Insurance Program. And the small communities that dot the agricultural landscape, Knights Landing, Clarksburg, Gridley, you know, collections of two or three hundred homes, okay, well, it's thought 
at least at the state level, that maybe we should have a special program for protecting those small communities. Not necessarily the entire basin they live in, but maybe with compartment levees or other structures that might afford some relief to the generally not well-off people who live in these small communities and who will be horribly oppressed if they have to live in a 100-year regulated floodplain with insurance and no building and all the rest of it. So those factors went into the drafting of the Central Valley Flood Protection Plan. And that is, how do we move the urban areas to 200-year flood protection, including protection against under seepage? What do we do with rural levees throughout the valley that are not going to meet that standard? And how do we address the small communities that dot the rural landscape? And, and that's really the essence of what the Central Valley Flood Protection Plan says, is that we now have I guess you could call it a three-tier system, urban area flood protection, protection for these small communities, which is a new idea and we don't really have a lot of examples of it, and then essentially continue with the protection that the rural areas have historically had with some focus on repairing the most egregious issues and problems they have in their system. And so we are now uh, beginning to work out, okay, how does that work? The other part of the Central Valley plan was to not exclusively focus on the protections needed in the urban areas, but also to think about what could we do to provide more system capacity. Are there opportunities here to widen the bypass systems and to allow the, the flood control program, the project, to convey higher, more extreme floods through the system safely? Those are somewhat controversial. Okay, and difficult because they don't always impart uh, protections immediately to the urban area. They make the system as a whole function better, but we're having a discussion, let's say, between us and DWR about how to prioritize between investing in these system improvements and investing in improvements to the urban area. Now, there are obviously environmental consequences. The environment does a lot better with the system improvements because it creates room to reestablish historic floodplain habitats as we've been doing and discussing in the Yola Bypass, as could be done in the Sutter Bypass or down in San Joaquin in the, you know, uh, the Paradise Cut Bypass down there. And the, enviros, the environmental interests are very, you know, anxious to see the system improvements be given more weight and more investment in the urban area we're struggling to meet our minimum 100-year and 200-year requirements because there are penalties now and, and have been but in the system for not meeting those thresholds. If you don't provide 100-year flood protection to your community, you can be facing very high insurance rates, you face land use restrictions and moratoriums, and if you don't meet the state's 200-year standard, you're going to face similar constraints on economic development in your community. So it's very important to the local agencies like me and the communities that we serve to be meeting those one and two hundred year targets while we then seek to work with the state to add resiliency and robustness to the system by expanding the common areas and providing for well or improved reservoir reoperation as we're doing at Folsom um, and other measures that make the system more robust. So what you will see in the next five to seven years is a working out of this debate and discussion primarily between us and the Department of Water Resources, which the voters of California, we thank you, uh, in 2006 provided $4.7 billion for the state to work with in addressing the improvements to the system. About half of that or maybe slightly more is gone, but about half is left. And so over the next five to seven years, we're going to be discussing what do we do with what's left. It has to be matched at the local level by property-based assessments that we raise. And we are both, we and the state, in turn managing our relationship with the federal government, which is you know, largely becoming more and more ineffectual given the partisan divide in Congress, the inability you know, of the federal government to really focus its attention on this problem, provide adequate funding to the Corps, and be a true partner with us in going forward. So a big part of our planning in this next period is really how do we at the local level and the state leverage our non-federal resources, adaptively manage our relationship with the Corps of Engineers, and 
make our way steadily forward. So maybe I'll stop, I'll take some questions. I've been kind of on a rant here, uh, but I hope I've stimulated maybe a little bit of thought and thinking. I could also, I know you've been talking about you know, water issues, water quality issues. There, there is an interest in DWR, and there'll be a big conference actually in April, where DWR is attempting to get more integrated thinking about how does what I've just been talking about in terms of improving the flood control system relate to improvements of the water system, of the environment affected by the flood and water systems, and of water quality oriented watershed type you know, planning that's been going on in the integrated regional water management program. So really those, there are those three programs. Integrated regional water management, which tends to happen sort of upstream of the floodplain down in the valley. And then the, the uh, you know, BDCP, the Bay Delta Conservation Plan, that could complement the CVFPP flood control plan. So DWR is really trying to think about are there opportunities as we spend money, plan these systems to achieve a higher degree of integration between these various initiatives. And that's something I could talk about if you're interested. So, I will stop. Yes. Oh. Um, I was wondering if you could talk a little bit about how SAFECO, is that how you? Yeah, SAFECA. SAFECA. Um, how SAFECO, SAFECA uh, collaborates with uh, the SACOG um, during the blueprint planning process and the SCS planning process. Um, and then also, I was reading recently that 18 levees were recently uh, completed, the infrastructure was rebuilt, and then Atomas Basin, I was wondering if you could kind of point to where okay. that is and what 24 were left that were still needing. Right. So, so in, in 2006, SAFCA wrote a white paper which basically laid out the elements that got incorporated into the Central Valley Flood Protection Plan, what I described, you know, high, high level of protection for the urban areas, protection for the small communities, and historic protection for the rural areas. We went over to talk to SACOG to be sure, because that's kind of consistent with SACOG's view. SACOG is trying to concentrate infrastructure, now they're jurisdiction is roads and transportation, but they're trying to concentrate urban infrastructure in a smaller footprint. Now their goal is to have the same number of people living on half as many acres as we had in the prior period. So they're very interested in flood control planning that could be compatible with beginning to concentrate urban development in its existing areas and you know, beginning to move away from the idea of spilling it over into the Plumas Lakes and the Tomases and other basins. Now the state plan has gone a long way to doing that because if you cannot demonstrate your capability to provide 200 year flood protection in a levied area, including under seepage, you're not going to be able to subdivide. And that means that huge swaths of this area here are not going to be able to develop. And SACOG is consistent with that. And so when we looked at our plan and the blueprint, we weren't so far away in terms of where they envisioned the development occurring and we thought it could be feasible under these new constraints. And SACOG actually endorsed our SAFCA white paper in 2006 and that helped the legislature to adopt SB5, which was pretty much along those lines and then got translated into the Central Valley Flood Protection Plan. Okay, so now let's talk about Natomas. Natomas is that big basin right there. I don't have a pointer or something, but does everybody know where Natomas is? It's, th it's do we have something? Yeah, <laughs> right there. <laughs> okay, now it's 53,000 acres. It's huge. It was a product of that earlier period. You know, it was built in 1912 to 1914 by a private company. The private company bought 75% of the acreage in Natomas for a dollar an acre. And then it was a huge gold dredging company. And then it took its dredging machines and its capital and its experienced labor and it went in and it put the suction dredge to work, 
in the Sacramento River and it had its bucket excavators digging the, the drainage canals and piling up the levees and they basically built the Natomas Basin and the one just to the north, Reclamation District 1001, and then went out to promote it as, hey, come and live in Sacramento. You could be a yeoman farmer on 80 acres right near downtown Sacramento. It's great. And you can see advertisements from that period, and it was, a, it was a real estate development. Now, it turned out people weren't quite as enamored with farming, and they went to bigger acreages, and finally they sold out all their land, I think, in the 1950s. But that basin functions in a particular way in relation to the system, okay? Because you can see the basin is just downstream at its upper end, just on the other end of the Fremont Weir. Okay, and so when water comes out of the Sacramento feather system and out of the Sutter Bypass, you want it to go over the Fremont Weir and into the Yola Bypass. The flow split is around 85% into the Yola Bypass and about 15% into the Sacramento River Channel. And so it's always been thought from a flood planning point of view that you do not want a levee failure up at that end of the system because that could have the you know, potential to bring all this water into the Sacramento River corridor down by the city of Sacramento. And so really, even though it's been a huge basin, it's always been anticipated that it would be an urbanizing area, that we would build you know, solid, stout levees around the Tomas because of its particular position within the system. And so the 18 miles that we did were exactly the five miles of the cross canal, at the upper end there, and then the, yeah, and then 13 miles down along just south of the airport because that, you cannot afford to suffer a levee failure there. The 24 miles are the rest of the way around the Tomas, okay? But 18 of those 24 miles are on the east side where we really don't have the same kind of issues. In the lower east side you can see Dry Creek and Arcade Creek come in and the American River has an influence there and, and that's an area where you could have a problem. But once you get upstream of Dry Creek along that entire east side in Thomas, we're really not at such great risk. Okay, so the idea has been that that's an area which if properly designed and protected could reasonably sustain development. Okay, and what we believe, because I don't know if anybody's been out there, if you have, you could go drive the Garden Highway one day and you see the levee that we've built. It's, it's, it's massive. So we did a hydraulic analysis and we took the 500 year flood centered in the Sacramento Feather River and we ran it through the system. And where it overtopped rural levees, which it did by, you know, a matter of a foot or two, we, you know, allowed those levees to fail and the water go out, which we think that would probably happen. And when we got all the way down to Natomas, the 500 year flood elevation was four feet below the top of the levee we've built. So we really built this massive thing at the bottom of the system that has just incidental floodplain storage above it because those are the ag areas that can't do the undersea bridge that, you know, will not be able to meet the urban standard and that while not designed to flood, that's just the system we've inherited. And, you know, therefore Natomas is in a relatively advantageous position on the Sac Feather River and similarly on the American River because in the American River you have to get a large discharge out of Folsom all the way down to the bottom if you're going to get it into the Natomas Basin. And as you might imagine, some of you have probably been over to Sac State and looked across the levee and gone, man, this thing is not that wide here because we built the levee to protect Compass Commons in the 1950s and it's very narrow there. So you have a nice wide unlevied floodplain above and then it becomes an hourglass to get by Sac State until you get down to the bottom where the Natomas Company did their work and the city insisted that they put the levee far back on the north side. So it's not clear that you could get a massive amount of water down to the bottom to hit Natomas even on the American River. So while everyone can debate the wisdom, because it, it is a deep basin, okay, I mean there are 20 foot flood depths if you get, you know, the sack feather going in there. Not necessarily the American, but if you get the sack feather going into Thomas, you can have very deep depths, but, you know, we're kind of working our way to a point where 
you know, the likelihood of that occurring is becoming less and less. Yes, sir. Uh, just to follow up on that uh, question about the American River, right? Um, the, the Natomas Basin was historically called the American Basin. That's correct. It was a lake. It was a lake. And yeah. And it was the low point and very much functionally the overflow basin for the American River. Right. Now, how did that escape the logic of the bypass systems? Like they saw the, the Yolo bypass, they saw the Calusa bypass, or Calusa area, they saw how those things could connect and sort of replace those wetland right. basins, but somehow the American completely escaped it. Well, it wasn't necessarily an overflow bypass for the Sacramento River. It was an overflow bypass for Arcade Creek, Dry Creek, the tributaries, and to some extent the American River. Okay, but as we began to develop in the city of Sacramento, really there was only a levee on the uh, you know, south side of the river because that's where the city was, but eventually North Sacramento came along and North Sacramento after Natomas. North Sacramento began to develop the levee system that then went along the Natomas East Main Drain and up, you know, past Cal Expo. Okay, and then finally along came Campus Commons and w we did cut off the overflow to the north, which in the, in the flood of 1955, it, that's where it went. I mean, there was no levee, you know, protecting uh, that part of Arden and, you know, what is now Campus Commons. So, you know, however it escaped prior planners, and in, in that day and age, by the way, if the Natomas Consolidated Company was prepared to come and do this project, there was no Central Valley Flood Protection Board or 408 permit that you needed from the Army Corps of Engineers, man, you needed just a lot of gumption, a lot of money to go do this project. And so that's to some extent what we have inherited, but I guess my point is, relatively speaking, it is a protectable area if it's properly done. Now that doesn't mean you can't have beavers and you know, unforeseen this and that, but I mean the levee that we're building out there is 60 feet wide. It's pretty wide and it's very high relative to everybody else. Yes, sir. My question is a little long term. Uh, the what? Uh, it's a long term question. A yeah. Question that you think. How do you think about it? This in the next hundred years or fifty years? Are you thinking of continuing to maintain and build and continue this, or eventually it's there's an effort towards going back to how naturally it was, or there's no scope for this? It's already too much built, and there's no chance because anything that is man-made has a life and needs maintenance. Right. So. Right. So. We are trying to build the most robust possible flood infrastructure, okay, but you know, as to future development, I mean, you know, the blueprint lays out. This is what we expect of a metropolitan area like Sacramento. It will become more densely populated over time. It will be growing ho hopefully more vertically than horizontally, but it will be densely populated and it will continue to rely on this flood control system for its protection, okay? We are somewhat hampered in what we can do with the flood control system outside Natomas. Take, for example, the pocket area where, you know, the development is right up to the toe of the levee. You can't make a 60-foot wide levee in the pocket area unless you're willing to take out 300 you know, private parcels there and buy them out, which is, I don't believe the community is quite prepared to do. So the resiliency that we're thinking about at this point is we are improving Folsom Dam so that it can handle much larger floods more efficiently. We are building up the American River, the resilience of the American River Channel so it can take higher flows from Folsom Dam safely down through the channel. And then we are working regionally with West Sacramento and Yolo County to widen, I guess I got to point this one out, or maybe not, to, to widen the Sacramento bypass. Do you see the, you know, down, yeah, oh, right there. Okay, that is where the discharge of the American River goes. It goes over the Sacramento Weir and bypass and into the Yolo bypass. Okay, so as we're planning for higher flows, on the American River, we want to give those higher flows an opportunity to go out 
into the Yolo Bypass, a much wider channel with less at stake on either side of its levees, and not go down the Sacramento River Channel where it would threaten the levee in the pocket area. So we are planning to make the system more robust and more resilient in that way. And, you know, just to give you an example, I said the largest floods of record going all the way back to 1862 where we have empirical data on the size of that flood and it's thought that the 1862 flood in the American River was on an order of magnitude similar to 1986 and 1997. So now we have, you know, 100 and whatever, 60 years. Okay, the flood that we are planning for here is 50% larger than 1862, 90, 1880, 1986, and 1997. Now, 50%, that's a, that, is a, that is a significant increase. We meanwhile, I was saying earlier, we have a colleague here at Davis, Lev Kavis. I don't know exactly what department he is in. Sybil. Sybil. So Lev is in the business of studying the physics of rainfall and, you know, convection. And so he is working with international climatological models to kind of figure out how big can a Pineapple Express be? Okay, it's hearkening back to what is the largest, most extreme flood that's reasonably foreseeable that could come to your basin? And that's what he's studying. We're hoping to bring together his work and the work we're doing on, you know, with the core, more statistically oriented, to show that with the improvements that we are implementing, that we can handle a very extreme flood on the American River within the tolerance of our levee system. Now, whether that holds up for another 160 years or not, you know, we don't know because some people would say, gee, looks like you've got a trend toward more extreme floods. Or it looks like global warming could be a problem. Global warming, so far, people aren't saying necessarily will make the floods more extreme, but they will alter the rain-snow balance and make it harder for our cooperative operation of Folsom to work effectively. But I, I don't think we've yet come to the conclusion that global warming will make the three-day volume more extreme. So, we are thinking a hundred years out, but it's not easy to see you know, what could nature deliver? Yes, sir. Two questions. What's the role of the extreme precipitation symposium in the two years? And also, when there's high water, who's managing it? Or yeah. The so, so we have had what is known as the weather symposium, or the extreme precipitation symposium, many of them held at Davis since 1994 and they're organized by a a volunteer Gary Estes now here's a great lesson in American civics you know a, a citizen of the city of Auburn has taken it upon himself to engage the mighty core the Department of Water Resources and SAFCA and everybody else and to get them to think more coherently about extreme floods now Gary's point was he was part of a group of people who in the 1980s thought that this whole thing with Auburn Dam is overblown. That if you properly designed and managed Folsom Dam and the levee system downstream, you could plan for 100 years. You didn't need the Auburn Dam to handle extreme floods. And part of their theory was that if we physically modified Folsom so that it could release water more efficiently and if we prepared our downstream levee system to handle higher releases more safely and if we implemented weather forecasting then we could accomplish the goal of handling very extreme floods with the improved infrastructure that we have without necessarily the benefit of building a new and what they thought to be destructive or wasteful facility in Auburn. So Gary's thesis, and it's, it's borne out. We've done an incredible amount of work through the Extreme Weather Symposium in pushing the National Weather Service and in turn the Corps of Engineers and Department of Water Resources to think, you know, in our circumstance where, where you modify the Folsom Dam so it becomes a more efficient tool, 
Okay, if you put your sentinels out to look for Godzilla, the monster storm that we're worried about, that you ought to be able to get indicators or signals of Godzilla's arrival before he actually steps right on you. And if you do, you can start reacting to Godzilla and clearing the way to safely pass him by. That was their theory, because up to the time when we started the Weather Symposium, the idea was, no, 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 until I see Godzilla, I don't know for sure he's coming. And so the reservoir operators would, you know, just say, no, no, we, we operate based on the inflow that we measure to the reservoir. And for 18 years, Gary's been trying to say, no, you need to develop the tools and the technology to anticipate because in, a, in 24 to 48 or certainly 72 hours, we can evacuate an enormous amount of water out of the dam to create empty space for these extreme events. It just means you have to be ready, prepared, and institutionally okay with the idea of operating on a forecast. Even though you could, nobody believes that Godzilla is going to sneak up on you and nobody saw him. Okay, nobody believes that. Okay, the, you, missed, you missed Godzilla. People do believe, and we argue all the time, whether Godzilla is a sort of ponderous monster that doesn't move so quickly, or whether it's like the, the hose with the nozzle on it, and, you know, the thing moved up to the Feather River, and you know, you had a false positive. Okay, we have that argument all the time, but so you have a false positive. Better that you had a false positive than, you know, the monster actually got you. And so that's where, uh, another answer to your question, we are evolving toward a more technically based rapid response system in the American River to, to handle these things. Another thing that's happening you might be interested in, although it's centered in the University of California Berkeley and the University of California Merced, but there is a group of scientists who's gotten an NSF grant to go and study the potential for the watershed and particularly the snowpack to absorb rainfall and thus diminish the amount that actually reaches the reservoir. And they believe that with better instrumentation and modern day technology that we actually could have real-time monitoring of the infiltration capacity of the watershed which in some floods could account for as much as a hundred or two hundred thousand acre feet of storage which would definitely affect our responsiveness to these big storms. So that's another area of technical development is to get better at understanding how the watershed might respond to extreme w rainfall you know on a real-time basis that then you can gauge your reservoir response too. So there's quite a bit of new technology coming online here that I'm gonna guess over the next 10 or 20 or 30 years is going to make the system much more responsive. Yes. Yeah. Well, get you some get you some exercise here. I wanted to ask. And so they would set their premium rates based on three to four billion a year of of claims. And they could cover them. Well, then along came Katrina. It was like 16 billion, and they didn't have it. Okay, and so they had to go to the treasury to borrow the 16 billion. And, you know, now they're in debt to the Treasury. Now they've had a little more debt come in from Sandy. So the Congress is looking at this and going, well, man, you've got to get your program to be more actuarially based. Okay, and so FEMA is now faced with this challenge, and the Flood Insurance Renewal Act of 2012 is basically setting them on this course to say, you can't base the flood insurance premiums on your historic claims, you have to base it on the actual risk of that particular structure that you're insuring. And that can be extremely expensive. I mean, take these flood basins up here. I mean, let's say, you know, they could pass, what, a 70-year flood. A flood with a .0014 chance of occurrence in any year. Okay, and you want to cover 200,000 dollars of damage. Okay, so multiply that and you get $2,800 a year of insurance plus administration on top of that plus the reserve fund they're supposed to create. You could be looking at three or $4,000 a year of insurance just to live in a farm in one of these ag areas. 
and that could be where we're headed. Okay, and then scale that down to your little house in Knight's Landing, you're still talking about $2,000 a year for somebody who doesn't have that kind of money. And while we are probably going to be able to protect ourselves in Sacramento sufficiently to at least not be required to buy flood insurance, or even now FEMA is actually considering requiring it in residual floodplains beyond 100 years, where the risk starts to get lower. Okay, but that starts to be a little more affordable for people like in Sacramento or Natomas. I mean, suppose we actually do have 500-year flood protection in Natomas, probably $400 a year to cover $250,000 of, of damage. Okay, that's, that's maybe a little more reasonable. But in some of these other areas, this is gonna be a true challenge for us. In the rural parts of our system here, these rates, if they truly are going actuarial, are gonna be very economically challenging. And not only that, you can't rebuild your farmhouse. You can't put a new rice dryer out there, you, you know. So the nation is going to have to deal with what do we want to do with these agricultural areas that have been tremendously productive, that are an integral part of our, you know, socioeconomy, but who really can't afford the cost to live in these levee protected floodplains. But on the other hand, they're not the ones imposing these massive degrees of exposure on the National Flood Insurance Program either. That's the cities, but the cities are capable, at least in our case, of probably working their way to a structural level of flood protection that makes the risk, you know, even if actuarially calculated, more manageable. So it's a big problem in the country, coastal areas in particular. Look at the discussion in Sandy. Oh, geez, are we going to put a barrier there? Are we going to move the houses out? Are we going to make them higher? And most communities don't like, especially of size, don't like the idea that you're going to leave. And so I think this is a, a definitely a question that we're going to take on. But right now, the federal taxpayer is the, the buck stops with the federal taxpayer because FEMA covers its exposure by going to the Treasury and borrowing. And we're all now faced with how is that account going to be set in better order and are we prepared? necessarily to pay the cost of bringing it into better order or should even if even if our areas can reduce their actuarial exposure down to something more reasonable should they be asked as members of this pool of at-risk people to contribute to other people's risk or should the whole society continue to to subsidize those people let me uh, get in one last question um, <laughs> Traditionally, the, the federal government has had a huge role in flood management. Over time, I think their budgets and their capabilities often in many ways have been diminishing. Um, certainly, the consensus in Congress about the flood control role has, has changed and probably diminished. The state role in California has, has come up in the last decade to try to, to remedy some of that reduction in federal attention. Uh, and then certainly, the local governments in your agency is, right. is among them sort of risen up to, to fill that void, so to speak. What do you see as the future of sort of state, federal, local collaboration, cooperation, battling on right. managing these water problems? So I've been at SAFCA for 25 years. The annual federal appropriation for Sacramento, which is regarded as, along with New Orleans, one of the most at-risk cities in the country, the annual federal appropriation in 2012 reached slightly more than $90 million one year. Before that, it was 70, 60, 50, go back in time. Okay, we don't really see that it's going to get much bigger than 90. In fact, it probably will get a little smaller once we finish Folsom Dam, which is a mega project, you know, in the country. So there's not a lot of federal money to fuel the kinds of improvements that we need. On the other hand, there's still 2.3 billion left in 1E that we can potentially leverage. Then you get to the local level. Now at the local level, we all have to decide, well, what is really the capacity of the local community to contribute here? Okay, and, and we uh, derive our revenue from special property-based assessments. So, you know, benefiting properties in the floodplain get assessed a certain amount based on their square footage, whether it's residential, commercial, industrial, and the relative depth of flooding in their area, okay? for 
Residential homes, I'll just give you the range in Sacramento. For residential homes in Sacramento, the annual assessment ranges, and I'm gonna, we talk about it in annual, but it actually drives the point home more if you talk about it in monthly. The annual assessment ranges from about $3 a month in the heart of the American River floodplain to right now about $12 a month in Natomas, our highest level, okay? Davis just passed a $34 a month water charge. Okay, so that gives you some sense that flood control has been a highly subsidized uh, you know, infrastructure cost. And there certainly would appear to be room for an increase in local contribution. But really the only thing that causes local communities to increase their willingness to contribute is if they're going to pay more in flood insurance than the assessment. So insurance has been the constant tool that we have used to sort of establish what should a community pay, which is why in answer to the earlier question, if we had more actuarially based insurance, you would have an indicator for whether it's a good investment to put more of your local money into infrastructure because your assessment would be less than your insurance. But we haven't quite got there yet. We still just have the crude, I mean, I have sold this insurance thing three times. And we're probably going to go another couple of times. Each time the system changes the new engineering and guess what, you're falling back in the 100 year floodplain. But if you pay assessment, I'll get you out. I mean, we've done that three times. And it, it's really the only thing. Otherwise, most people go, I'll give you 40 or 50 bucks a, a, a year and that's about it. And the only thing that stirs them, and that would be, you know, the three to four dollars a month. The only thing that stirs them to go past that is a consequence like insurance that says, oh, well, in that light, maybe I'd give you more. And you had these similar debates. I mean, people over here saying, ah, oh, okay, we can do it. We don't need that new thing. We're 34 bucks a month. You know, so it's sort of hard to kind of calculate how do people really assess their capacity to pay for things. And in our case, we need, if we're going to be successful, because you were pointing out in your PPIC thing, you know, there's no natural fee for service base for flood control. It's not like I pay for my sewage, you know, come on, I gotta flush my toilet, and they tell me how much it costs, I gotta pay it. I pay for my water, but in flood control it's not like that. And so the indicator is more the actuarial insurance cost that could be used more effectively to help people understand what, what their actual stake is and, and what they should be investing. But we got a, a long way to go along those lines. Well, thank you very much, Tim. Thank you. Thank you.